remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Travis Cook back with you once again. And last week, the Drudge Report, very popular stopping point on the internet for the news of the day, uh, the Drudge Report ran into a little bit of controversy when reporting on the executive orders of Barack Obama when it comes to gun control. You know, the uh, executive orders where Obama effectively urinated all over the Second Amendment. Uh, during their reporting of that, the Drudge Report had one particular piece in which they had the headline on their on their page above the fold, and above the headline there, they had a picture of Adolf Hitler and a picture of Joseph Stalin. And upon releasing that, oh, the left just went absolutely over the top. They couldn't believe it. And you heard the cries all over television and radio of, How dare you mention Adolf Hitler's name in the same breath as Barack Obama? How dare you compare Obama to Stalin? And oh, they were just up in arms about it all. Of course, a few days later, Bob Schieffer compared fighting the NRA to fighting the Nazis on Face the Nation, and that didn't seem to offend the left nearly as much. We didn't hear nearly as much outcry over that. Oh, well, the mainstream media didn't find that too bad. But they were absolutely horrified that any of us would dare draw comparisons between Barack Obama and Adolf Hitler. And it's true. Few things anger liberals anymore, or it may make them go any more apoplectic, any more so than comparing Obama or any other liberal to Hitler, Stalin, or the like. You often hear libs explain, you lose an argument the second you bring up Hitler's name. In fact, there's a, a liberal talk show host here in the St. Louis area named Mark Bland, and, and when I mentioned on my uh, Facebook page that I was preparing a show on this topic, he immediately responded to the post and said that he's invoking the Hitler rule. And the Hitler rule is that your points are invalid the second that you mention Adolf Hitler's name. But is that really so? Is it really so that your arguments are illegitimate when you mention Hitler's name if there are historical similarities between the two? Now, don't get me wrong. I get it. I know that it's terribly uncomfortable for, for any of us in America to believe that any politician in this country, any leader in this country, even one we vehemently disagree with, it's terribly uncomfortable to think that any of them could go to the links of a Hitler or a Stalin or, or any of the rest. But does that, I don't want to say believe, but, but does that hope that no American would ever go that far, does that hope justify that we ignore historical events that might be in common between the two or similarities between the two? I don't think that it does. And when you actually look at it, you can look at the, the rise to power of both Hitler and Obama and you see that they base their rise to power on the idea of some kind of mythical class struggle. You know, where they, they claim that there is one segment of society to be blamed, if you will, for the supposed hardships of everybody else. In Hitler's case, he blamed the Jews. In Obama's case, he blames the so-called wealthy. And when the Nazis were coming into power, they promised the German people that they would rein in big business and end the class struggle. Does that sound familiar? It should. Hitler also promised government health care and did some horrific things with it once he got it. That sound familiar? Hitler also took guns away from the population. Well, okay, specifically he took guns away from the Jews, and that didn't work out particularly well for them, if you recall. And meantime, Obama's trying to take guns away from the law-abiding citizens while doing little, if anything, to take them out of the hands of the criminals. You know, all in all, both Hitler and Obama operated under the idea that government will give you something and enrich your life in some way in exchange for more unchecked power. In the days of, of Hitler, you often heard people when confronted with some of the atrocities that Hitler was doing, they would always say, well, the trains run on time. It was that idea that you could buy the silence of the people or buy their apathy if you just made their lives a little bit better. And Hitler, Stalin, and countless other scourges of history, including today in North Korea, or over the years in the, the various banana republics and tin pot dictators in Africa and South America, those regimes that have come and gone over the years, so many of them have operated off of that same principle. The worst, most oppressive regimes in world history all seem to start from the idea that government must take the reins and right the wrongs that currently exist in your life. 
But with all of that being said, there are many people that, in spite of our legitimate criticism of Obama's actions, and in spite of the historically accurate similarities between Obama's actions and some of those of dictators past, a few of which I pointed out here, some of those people still question how we can infer that Obama could end up being another Hitler, another Stalin, or worse. They wonder how we can go that far. To those people, they believe that there's something separating Obama or liberal, other liberals in America from the extreme cases of a Hitler or Stalin. So I wanted to explain to you people why we're so concerned about that, why it's a legitimate fear on our part. You know, many liberals, and many moderates for that matter, would claim that it is possible to expand government without going to the extremes of a Hitler or a Stalin. And while that is possible in theory, the problem for us on the right as we examine history is that we have no idea where this proverbial stopping point is for liberals in America in terms of the expansion of government. I mean, I get it. Liberals view government as a necessary tool for you know, moving humanity forward and for bettering our lives and for taking an active role in moving humanity ahead of where they are now. I understand that. On the other hand, conservatives view government often as an impediment to moving humanity ahead and to raising the standard of living. So two very different viewpoints, and, and, and I get that. But the problem arises in that many of us on the conservative side don't see the point at which liberals in America will stop. We don't see the point at which liberals would say, okay, that level of government is just enough. We see you pushing for more and more and more and more government through history, but we never see you getting to the point where you say, okay, that's enough, no more. Where is the ceiling for the proper amount of government for an American liberal these days? Well, that's a difficult question to answer in the year 2013, just as it's been a difficult question to answer throughout American history. When you look at American history, and you look at it over the last 150 to 200 years, you'll see that whenever liberals have gotten something they fought for, something they've wanted, they very seldom ever stopped after achieving it. They've always pressed on for a little bit more, a little bit more, even after they get what you think would be reasonable or what they fight for so hard. You look at something like civil rights back in the 1960s, the left fought and fought and fought for that, and they got it. And hey, there's a lot of things in the Civil Rights Act that even those of us who are conservative would say, yeah, that's reasonable. There's some things there that, that are positive things. But once that was passed, you didn't see liberals say, okay, we got our Civil Rights Act, that topic's done, problem solved, on to the next thing. No, they kept pushing. Then they wanted affirmative action and different other types of accommodations given to minorities, even though they already had their Civil Rights Act. So where was the stopping point? We don't know. You look at the income tax. When that came about, liberals pushed for years for that. They finally got it. And when they got it, did they say, okay, we got our income tax. That's done. Let's go on to the next thing. No. Instead, then they wanted a higher percentage of money to come from the wealthy. They wanted to raise the tax rate on them. They did that and did that. Hey, we're still having that argument today. Over a century after we got the dad blamed income tax. You look at Social Security. The left fought and fought for Social Security. They got it. Did they stop and say, okay, that's the absolute maximum amount of government we want? Oh, no. Then they pushed for Medicare. They got Medicare. Then they pushed for universal health care. You see what happens? They get one thing they want, but it's never enough. It's always the nose inside of the tent. So with that historical backdrop in mind, with that bit of American history in mind, with the last 150 to 200 years in mind, there's nothing to indicate to us that liberals in America, including Obama, would ever stop before getting to a Hitler or a Stalinist level of government involvement and interference. While it might be crazy to some people to think of Obama or any liberal who comes after him marching Christians off to the gas chambers, or confiscating the wealth of the wealthy people in America, or executing political enemies, while that might seem crazy to some, the bottom line is to a lot of us as we look at history, we don't see anything that would indicate to us that the liberals have a stopping point short of that. I'd love to see one. I would love to know where their ceiling is. If we knew that, then maybe we could work together a little bit better. But we don't know where that ceiling is. They've never indicated it. I think a lot of rank and file liberals, voters and so forth, I think they assume that such a ceiling's out there. But to those of us who disagree with you, to those of us who are politically opposed to you, you got to understand that we don't know where that ceiling is. We don't know what your limits are and therefore we can't trust you. 
So when we compare Obama to Hitler, it should not be simply because both are in favor of government-controlled health care. It should not be simply because both are in favor of massive gun control. While those commonalities are historically accurate, that is not enough to make a valid comparison, and I will acknowledge that. Those in and of themselves are not reason enough, I will grant you. But in addition, such a comparison should be made because Hitler has shown us and Stalin has shown us the most extreme end result of what big government policy can result in. At the same time, the American left over the last 150 years has not demonstrated the point of where they will stop short of such extreme levels. We don't know that you won't go there. Remember, Hitler did not start killing massive amounts of people overnight. He did not start committing atrocities overnight. He moved slowly over years. He won the trust of a nation. He convinced the people of Germany that there was a class of people to be blamed for all of their problems and kept chipping away and chipping away and chipping away until they finally bought into it. And only then was he able to undergo his reign of terror. How can we say that Obama or any other liberal in America is not undertaking a similar strategy today? What is there to separate the two? Historically speaking, there's nothing to separate them. Would Barack Obama ever go as far as Adolf Hitler? I don't know. I'm not telling you that he would, but I'm certainly not telling you that I know he wouldn't. And the fact that I honestly don't know, the fact that I cannot have that degree of faith in that particular leader whom I vehemently disagree with politically, that I cannot have that faith that there is a level at which he would stop short, the fact that I don't know that and I don't have that comfort level, that is what needs to be addressed before the so-called Hitler rule can end any political arguments in America. The fact that we have no indication over the last 150 years that the American left will stop short of Hitler-esque methods and results. Where's the stopping point on the left? I don't know. Is there one? There very well might be. But if there is, those of you on the American left as it stands today have not done a good job of showing that point to us and to the American people. And until you do, comparisons of your side to Hitler, Stalin, and all the rest are completely legitimate. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next time.